Um, thank you to the conference organisers for putting on such a great conference and thank you to everyone else for listening to me talk about this. Um, okay, so I should say that I guess like what I'm interested in is the disagreement between sentientists, biocentrists and ecocentrists about the bounds of justice, okay, so which entities fall within the domain of justice. Um, so the outline of the talk, I'm going to sort of say a little bit about how sentientists have extended um, considerations of justice to sentient animals, and then how some biocentrists slash ecocentrists, um, it's a bit unclear like what some of their positions are, but how they extend considerations of justice to non-sentient entities. Um, and then I'm going to suggest that we need to take a look at the concept of justice um, in order to kind of make headway in this debate, because it feels like there's a kind of impasse between um, the various positions. Um, and then I'm going to suggest that there are two strategies for those who want to defend justice for non-sentient entities. Um, firstly, that they might argue that non-sentient entities can be the bearers of rights, or that justice isn't about rights, but it's also about recognition. So, the central question, as I mentioned, is which entities are candidates for entitlements of justice? Okay, so that's the question that like, I'm concerned with. Um, my claims today are far more modest than the claims in the abstract. <laughs> so if you read the abstract, scrap that from your mind. Uh, really all, I'm, all I can do here, I think, is a bit of philosophical house cleaning. Um, I want to get the kind of the structure of the arguments that I think that people need to be making about justice um, clear. And I think that, and so the central claim I want to make is that possession of rights is a prerequisite for entitlements of justice. Okay? Um, so if you keep that in mind, it tells us something about how this debate needs to be how this debate needs to proceed between sentientists, biocentrists and ecocentrists. A confession which will be obvious from the abstract is that I am doubtful that non sentient entities um, can be entitlement bearers of justice, but I'm not sure that I can establish that conclusion here. Um, but I think that when I talk about the two strategies that I think are available to um, biocentrists and ecocentrists, it should become clear why I am doubtful. Okay, so scope of justice beyond humanity. So the last 40 years in political philosophy have seen like, a proliferation um, of global justice um, theories and really the debate in global justice is about whether the bounds of justice extend beyond the national community, uh, beyond geographical or territorial um, boundaries and whether they kind of encompass the whole of humanity, right? So is justice something that's uh, national or global? Um, and that's one kind of boundary question, and that's what I was mostly concerned with when I wrote my PhD. But now I'm more interested in this question of species boundaries, right? So where do we, where does, where do considerations of justice extend beyond um, humans, if at all? Okay. So I think that like in the recent um, literature on animal rights and justice, so we've hear this kind of phrase, the so-called political concern <coughs> in animal, right, you know, animal ethics, we see that like a lot of people are defending this claim that sentient animals um, have entitlements of justice, that these entitlements are kind of positive, that we have, ought to uh, structure our institutions in certain ways that uh, satisfy uh, <coughs> the entitlements of justice that sentient animals have, and I'm completely on board with all of this. Okay, so basically everything I say here, I've said in print, right? But now I've become concerned about what I've said. So the story goes something along the lines of sentient non-human animals have the capacity for well-being and therefore they have claims to and against certain forms of treatment. So on these views, one function or one central function of justice is to protect and promote well-being. Um, so entities with the capacity for well-being matter from the perspective of justice because their interests um, generate entitlement um, and all of those entities which kind of lack the capacity for well-being or interest they kind of fall outside of the scope of justice okay so I've kind of bought into this picture that I'm a thinker um, but as I said I'm not so sure so I'm kind of I guess like I was following people um, 
like Nussbaum, um, <coughs> Donaldson and Kimmel and Cochrane. So I'm going to um, kind of go through some some of their brief attempts to close the door on non-sentient entities, right? So all of these people want to say justice is just about sentient entities. Only sentient entities have the capacity for well-being. Only sentient entities have interests that are worth protecting from, or that are guaranteed protection, uh, protections of justice. So how do they, what is it that's so special about sentience? So Nussbaum kind of muses about whether it would be harmful to kill um, a mosquito from the perspective of the capabilities approach. Okay, so I'm assuming that most people are familiar with it. But the general idea is that <coughs> sentient animals have um, central capabilities that ought to be protected as a matter of justice because they're crucial to the flourishing and well-being of those animals. Um, so in the case of mosquitoes, this realm seems to be suggesting or assuming, like, you know, if they don't feel pain, then is there any problem here? And she says sentience is not the only thing that matters for basic justice, but it seems plausible to consider the possession of sentience as a threshold condition for membership in the community of beings who have entitlements based on, on justice. Um, the justification for this, as you can see in the sentence above, is that we should just admit the wisdom in utilitarianism, right? And that's it, that's all we get as to why we're uh, excluding non-sentient entities. Um, Donaldson and Kimmaker take a similar kind of line, only a being where subjective experience can have interests or be owed the direct duties of justice to protect those interests. A rock is not a person, neither is an ecosystem, an orchid, or a strain of bacteria. They are things, they can be damaged, but not subject to injustice. Justice is owed to subjects who experience the world, not to things. Non-sentient entities can rightfully be the objects of respect or love and care, but lacking subjectivity, they are not rightfully the objects of fairness, nor are they the agents of intersubjectivity, the motivating spirit of justice. Okay, so again, we get this story um, that is something about interest, having interest, having the capacity for well-being, being aware of the world in some way. These are the things that um, make one eligible for considerations of justice. Finally, Alistair Cochrane he says states of affairs may well make a plant a, be a better plant, but they can never make things better for the plant itself. States of affairs may improve or deteriorate such things as plants, but lacking conscious life, no state of affairs can actually make things better or worse for plants. Because they lack sentience, plants and inanimate objects possess no well-being and possess no interests. As such, recognising that animals possess rights because of their interests does not require us to recognise rights for such entities as plants, vases, books and bicycles. Now, just to flag, I actually think that uh, Cochrane's account is um, most in line with what I want to say later, uh, because he does start from this argument uh, to do with rights, but I'm also going to suggest that there's something inadequate about the way that he's kind of closing um, or limiting the bounds of justice here. Um, okay. Good. So, what about non-sentient entities? So, several people, Brian Baxter, David Schlossberg and Katie Fulfer have all argued that non-sentient entities can also be recipients of justice, okay? that the bounds of justice should extend to some non-sentient entities. They disagree a bit about which non-sentient entities, whether we're just talking about things that are alive, or whether we're talking about ecosystems, um, but yeah, they want to extend beyond um, non-sentient entities. And the negative part of their critique is that they find these appeals to sentience to be morally arbitrary. Okay? So when the animal rights justice people say it's you know, closing the door on non-sentient entities, um, because sentience is the thing that does the work, sentience is the feature that one must possess in order to be a recipient of justice, they just can't really, they find this implausible, right? What's the, what's the justification for that? Um, and they think that, they, they accuse, they often accuse these people of relying on an anthropocentric bias, so the accusation is something along the lines of um, what animal rights theorists are doing is picking a feature that is common in humans to sentient animals and thereby excluding the rest of the natural world, when really if we started looking at the natural world more broadly, we could pick a feature that we could identify in all things, right? So the positive part of their proposal 
is to extend justice, so in Baxter's case, to all entities with interests, uh, for full firm, <coughs> to all entities which have the capacity for flourishing and dignity, um, and for Schlossberg, for all entities who possess integrity. Okay, so we get these different attempts to um, come up with a non-anthropocentric way of delimiting um, the balance of justice. So, I have to say that I find some of these proposals quite compelling, right? At least what I find compelling is the response to Cochrane. I don't find his argument that um, plants don't have any interest whatsoever convincing, okay? So, for full fruit, for example, she's arguing, she's speaking here um, specifically of trees, and she says, minimally survival is part of a tree's flourishing, <laughs> as dictated by typical behaviour of its species. If the survival of a species of tree involves having access to a certain quality and amount of water, and a tree cannot grow according to its species norm without it, then clean water is, a good, is good for the tree. Not only for us, because we want to use the healthy tree for some human centred end, polluted water harms the tree, even though the tree cannot cognise that harm. Because it is a harm to the tree, sentence need not be the standard by which we assess harm and justice claims. Okay? Um, and you get a similar line of thought in Baxter's, so the plant literally has a good, it literally possesses the ability to protect itself, to reproduce itself, to flourish or suffer harm. And it's having these kinds of interests um, which seem to be connected uh, to the thought that these, these entities uh, can be recipients of um, justice. But still you get like a kind of a response back to those kinds of concerns, um, which is that even if we accept that plants and ecosystems can be assigned or do have interests, we might want to delimit the scope of justice to only those things who potentially experience, experience things as valuable for themselves. Okay? Um, so isn't, we might not want to deny that they have interest, but we might want to deny they don't have interest of the right kind. Okay? Um, but then the question is, why do only sentient interests matter when it comes to thinking about justice? Um, and Donaldson and Kimlicka give us one answer to this, so they say our theory is based on an account of one of the key purposes of justice, which is the protection of vulnerable individuals. Being an I, a being who experience, experiences, represents a particular kind of vulnerability, calling for a particular form of protection from the actions of others in the form of inviolable rights. What happens to sentient beings matters because it matters to them. It is the fact that sentient beings care about how their lives go that generates a moral claim on us. Um, so, I think that like I quite like that answer, but then I was worried because it seemed like Schlossberg was also making appeals to vulnerability on behalf of ecosystems, okay? So he says, it is the disruption and increasing vulnerability of the integrity of ecosystems that is at the heart of the injustice of climate change, both in terms of its impact on vulnerable human communities and non-human non nature. So I guess at this point, um, having read all of these things, I'm just not sure anymore, right, what's going on. It just feels like, I mean, for a while I thought that the debate had just kind of bottomed out at brute intu intuition, right? And some people were just like, no, it's sentience that's doing the work. No, it's somebody else. It's integrity, it's dignity, flourishing, whatever. And I guess like, I wasn't entirely sure what, what to take from that or where to go. Because as I mentioned at the start, I do have this sense that non-sentient entities can't be recipients of justice. But now I'm just unsure as to where that is, okay? So what comes next is an attempt to get clear about how we need to think about the question um, which entities count as, or can be candidates for entitlements of justice. Okay, so I think that everybody that is party to this debate is concerned with what I'm going to call political justice. So what they're concerned with is um, the claims that entities have over us that can be institutionally enforced, okay? And that means that our institutions can be structured in certain ways to protect the, the claims of those entities and that those considerations are owed directly to those entities. Um, 
So that's just the kind of the precursor to the, some of the stuff that's going to come now. Um, so I'm just going to say a little bit more about the concept of justice. I want to um, sketch something quite thin. I don't want to rely on anything too thick, so I'm not saying anything about the substan substantive content. It's really only about the normative structure of relations of justice and injustice. Okay. Um, so the first thing is that the domain of justice is the domain of rightful entitlement. So justice is about what we're due, we're owed these things. Um, justice and injustice is always done to, um, done by someone to some other. Okay. Um, as Pogger says, it's incoherent to hold that a law or institution is unjust, but unjust toward no one. Now, I'm going to say something in a minute about uh, <laughs> directed duties. Um, it's, so, justice is in some sense a four place predicate. Um, the source of injustice, if it be a law or an institution, um, is obviously not the thing that has the duty, right, towards individuals. Somebody else will have a duty to ensure that laws and institutions are just, okay? So I just wanted to clear that up. Maybe that was not clear. Maybe I just made it more confusing, but anyway, we'll <laughs> just go on. Um, okay, so... Justice is the domain of rightful entitlement. What are entitlements? What are the entitlements of justice? I take it that on all conceptions of justice, they're claim rights. Okay. Um, so essentially, like what it is to have a claim right is to have a claim against someone to a particular, uh, to some kind of treatment, right? Either they must do something for you or they're prohibited of doing something to you. So if I have a claim against you um, that, I know that you not assault me, then you have a correlative duty not to assault me, right? That's the kind of structure of claim rights and their correlative directed duties. So the duties are owed directly to the person with the claim right or the individual with Claim right. Um, so this means that when we violate our duties of justice, we don't merely act wrongly with regard to some others, but we directly wrong those individuals. Okay. Um, so the satisfaction of our duties of justice uh, thus depends on us acting in ways that respond directly to the correlative claim rights of others that others have against <coughs> us to perform or abstain from certain actions. So I think that this is really important to thinking about which entities can um, can be the bearers of just entitlements. Okay, so which entities we need to consider when we're uh, thinking about who has um, justice claims. So another feature of um, justice, which I think is what in part makes it so desirable to all of the people involved, is that duties of justice are prima facie enforceable. Okay? So this kind of ties to the stringency of justice talk. Right? People can be compelled um, to uphold their duties of justice. They can be um, coerced by the state, they can be coerced by others if they're failing. And that people's entitlements of justice are similarly protected. Right? They're afforded special um, protection. Um, and they're often taken to be um, normatively prior to other duties. Right? So they have that kind of priority. So finally, the last thing I want to say about justice um, is that the justice claims constitute only a subset of moral claims. Okay, so justice is not the whole of the moral domain, it's only a little bit of it. Um, so there are lots of moral values um, which are distinct from justice, um, like loyalty and honesty, and lots of um, moral flaws that we might have such as disloyalty, dishonesty, and selfishness, they might be wrong when they're not instances of injustice. Okay? Injustice really only connects to the violation of claim rights. Okay. Um, so injustice is a particular type of wrong. It must be done to some entitlement bearer, um, by some duty bearer. And these kinds of wrongs are directed in nature and they involve cases where perpetrators do not merely act wrongly with regard to someone or something, but they directly wrong entitlement bearers by violating the duties owed to them. So, 
I think that like, I mean it's worth kind of pausing to think like why the concept of justice is, has become so important both in animal rights theory and also in env environmental ethics. And it's because it has like many, many virtues that make it a useful thing if you're worried about the protection of particular entities, okay? So as I mentioned, justice is, duties of justice are taken to have a certain kind of stringency, so they have normative priority over, moral cons over other moral considerations, and we can be compelled by the state to fulfill our duties of justice. Also, the, I, the concept of justice and the value of justice operates at many different levels. So we can judge states of affairs, laws, policies, individuals to be just or unjust. Okay? Um, and that helps us to get at the systemic nature of wrongs. So it goes beyond the idea of interpersonal morality, which again appeals to people who are working with um, entities which have normally been kind of excluded from those kinds of considerations, right? where it's all just about us acting charitably towards um, particular individual animals or the environment, when really we know that there are all these systemic wrongs that we want to um, acknowledge. And then finally, um, I think the appeal of talking about justice for many people is that it gets at a particular type of wrong. Um, and that's that there's a wrong that's done, <coughs> it's a wrong that's done directly to the recipient in question. Okay? Um, it's not just a kind of indirect uh, wrong or instrumental harm or something like that. It's, that. it's a wrong that's done directly to the entity in question. Um, okay, so to sum up this um, part of the discussion, um, really, <laughs> I, I know it sounds quite simple, but justice requires the possession of enforceable, prima facie enforceable rights. Okay, so there might be um, other considerations which will rule out the, us being compelled to fulfil our duties of justice, but they are at least prima facie enforceable. Um, and so this necessitates, I think, that entitlement barriers within schemes of justice must be possessors of rights. Okay. Um, and the flip side of that, of course, is that the entitlement barriers must be the kinds of things to which we can owe directed duties, um, not merely duties with regard to. Um, so in order to be eligible for entitlements of justice, an entity must possess features or standing sufficient to ground claim rights against others. So I know this has all been a bit long-winded and a bit laboured, um, but I guess that what I'm trying to get at is it seems to me that the question about which entities um, can be candidates for entitlements of justice gets pushed back to this prior question of which entities possess rights. And as the cartoon indicates, I know that like this <laughs> probably all sounds obvious, but I think that there are two implications for drawing this out, for thinking about the, the most recent um, debate between animal rights theorists and um, eco-centrists. I think Baxter is a biocentrist, but anyway. Um, so, okay, so the first is that um, often in this debate, the idea that justice claims a claim rights is just missing, okay? So you get some mention of moral rights, um, but there's not really a kind of, uh, th there's no explicit connection between the idea of rights and the idea of, uh, of justice, okay? Um, and in some cases, there's no mention of rights at all. And I think in part, this is because there's a recent kind of, um, uh, there's a lot of work recently which has tried to extend Martha Nussbaum's capabilities approach to non-sentient entities. And because Nussbaum doesn't talk about rights, the rights language kind of falls out of the picture, right? But she's still talking about justice. So I think that actually Nussbaum's partly to blame for a lot of this. Um, because now what you get are claims to dignity, claims to integrity, claims to vulnerability, but no uh, story about how those things ground rights. Um, and I think that in order to be able to make the claim that 
these things also have entitlements of justice, or they have entitlements of justice because they have dignified existences, or because they have the capacity for integrity or vulnerability, there has to be a supplementary story about how those things ground rights in order um, for them to count as potential recipients of justice. Um, so, but I also think that, so it's not just, to my mind, it's not just a kind of problem for um, those people who want to extend justice to non-sentient entities. I also think that bringing out the right stuff has implications for some of these sentientist arguments, okay? So, as we saw, I mean, Nussbaum just kind of appeals to the wisdom in, uh, of utilitarianism. Donaldson and Kimlicka, they mention rights, but they're kind of, then they're talking about vulnerability, and then there's well-being, and there's interests, right? All this stuff is kind of floating around. Um, but I guess, like, it seems kind of common to a lot of these accounts that this idea that, uh, in senti uh, that um, sen non sentient entities don't have interests is kind of really prevalent in those sorts of arguments. And I actually think that that strategy is called into question if we think that what needs to be answered is the question of whether they have rights. And the reason for that is that it only really works, I think. Um, to appeal to this idea that they don't have interests, therefore they don't have rights, therefore they don't have claims of justice. If you buy into the idea that they have, um, or if you buy into the, an interest-based theory of rights. Okay? So one strategy that I think might be open to biocentrists and ecocentrists is to just deny the interest-based theory of rights and adopt a different um, strategy altogether. Um, I also think it's worth flagging that for, for people who want to defend an interest-based theory of rights in the animal's case, it's not enough to move from beings having interests to them being the kinds of beings that can bear rights. Okay? It's a separate question. The interest-based theory of rights is about what the function of rights is, and that's to further interests, but it doesn't tell you anything about who actually um, holds rights. Okay? So I think a lot of them are relying on the kind of Razian account, but for Raz, he says it's interest plus um, being the bearer of ultimate value. Right? So a further argument, I think, needs to be made um, in defense of the interest-based theory, also because the interest-based theory has notorious problems, right? So it might, not, it might even be undesirable on its own terms. But, so I do think that one strategy that's available for people who want to defend uh, justice for non-sentient uh, non entities is to just try to advance the idea that they have claim rights, but they're not grounded in um, an interest-based theory. The reason that I'm kind of sceptical this is going to work is that all of the main conceptions of rights that are on the table seem to require sentience, okay? Um, as a necessary um, condition, but not always sufficient. So for the will theory, it's about having control over um, the duties that others have to you, so being able to waive your rights, and that excludes sentient animals. Um, but it, at least sentience is going to be a necessary condition, it seems. Um, Lake Weynard's kind desire theory uh, requires that um, individuals of a particular kind have a kind based desire. So there's this desiring element that seems to be required, and I'm not entirely sure from having read this account whether it would be open to sentient animals, but or well, whether sentence would be sufficient, but it at least seems to be necessary. And then finally, you have the status based justifications for rights, which I'm actually kind of more fond of these days. Um, and I think that, the, that for those looking to defend non-sentient entities, the status-based justifications are the way to go, so these are going to be claims to do with intrinsic value. Um, okay, so that's all I want to say about <coughs> um, So, finally, so another strategy that some kind, sometimes comes up in the literature um, is to to deny that justice is only about rights. Um, and so there's quite often make claims made on behalf of non-sentient entities to the injustice um, associated with misrecognition. Um, so Schlossberg appeals to the work of Nancy Fraser um, and he tries to argue that 
ecosystems and the natural world will generally um, suffer the harm of status injury, that they're made invisible because their value is disrespected um, and they're and often not recognised. Um, I okay. You also get so there's a, so there's a lot of this in Schlossberg. He does quite a good job of at least trying to um, <coughs> make a case for applying like theories of recognition to the non-natural world. You get a similar line in Plumwood. She says we, we do them an injustice when we treat them as less than they are. Um, and she talks a lot about uh, us not us failing to recognise the value of. Um, uh, non-sentient entities. I think that there are two problems with this kind of approach. The first is that I'm not. I think that Schlossberg's appeal to Fraser is deeply problematic because, for her, a recognitional injustice is essentially grounded in the denial of rights. Um, so when people, when she's specifically talking about people. When people are denied their rights, they're unable to participate fully in society. And that's the harm of misrecognition, right? That's the status injury. And it's difficult to see how you can get something similar going um, for non-sentient entities who arguably don't have this interest in participation in political societies in the way that Fraser's concerned with, right? Um, but either way, I still I think that um, the rec these accounts of recognitional uh, injustice do presuppose rights. Um, so why is it that particular beings are owed recognition? Right? There's got to be some kind of claim there to recognition that they have a right to recognition. That there's something about their status which means that um, that there is some kind of injustice. Um, and I imagine that some people are just going to say, look, it doesn't have to be about rights, right? It's not about rights. We can still, we just treat them unjustly when we don't like, respect their value in the right kind of way. They don't have a right to it, but we just still act unjustly. But I think that if we detach rights from justice, sorry, apologies for the alliterate, I was, <laughs> what's the right word though, but I don't know. Basically, we destroy, um, we, we make the concept of justice indistinguishable from those other things that I was pointing out earlier, right? So there are all these other moral values. What's distinctive about justice is that it is about plain rights and their enforceability. And I think that if you start saying, well, it's not always about rights, then it's not really clear what it is about. And I also think that one consequence of detaching rights talk from justice talk is that it's no longer, it no longer has the appeal that it did, right? So when I was talking about what, what's attractive about justice um, to people who defend, who want to defend justice on behalf of animals um, and non-sentient entities, is that it is stringent, is that it is about the protection of rights. And if you detach it, then it's not really clear what the benefits of the justice talk are anymore. Um, okay, so to conclude, I basically just wanted to, <laughs> we might seem like belabor the point, um, but to make the point that we need to keep in mind that entitlement merits of justice must be eligible for rights, okay, for claim rights. Um, and that defenders of justice for ecosystems and other non sentient entities have to show that those entities are eligible for claim rights. It's not enough to say, well, they've also got interests or they've also got. They, they have dignified existences or they've got this capacity for integrity, right? Those things are only um, going to be part, well, they're only going to be useful to making the argument for justice claims if they're part of the argument for, make, for rights claims. But also sentience, sentientists have to show that sentience is sufficient for claim rights. And I actually think that lots of sentience, sentientists have done that. Um, um, but I also think that they have to show that non-sentient entities are not eligible for rights if they want to exclude them. So it's not so much that I think that they must exclude them, but I think that the kinds of statements that already exist in the animal rights literature where it's like, of course we're not uh, including plants, or of course we're not including ecosystems, those arguments are too quick. And I think that unless they're going to uh, give us a substantive, like, or a substantial kind of um, 
argument that shows us how one sentient entities cannot bear rights, then I think in absence of that, they should probably just remain neutral, right? But maybe those things do have rights and maybe the, they therefore um, can be the barriers of justice. But like I said, I'm skeptical that, uh, about the, the chances of showing that, but I just think that like, maybe animal rights theorists should be a little bit more humble <laughs> in like, what they think they can prove by appealing to interests um, and well-being. And I'm going to leave it there. Okay, thank you. regard to them, right? I think all of that is still definitely on the table. The, the trick comes, I think, when it seems like the harm gets connected to the direct wrongings, right? So, so we think we can harm and benefit them, therefore any way that we act that might harm or benefit them is a direct wrong to them. And I think that, I guess that that's the bit that I want to resist. Um, does that make sense? But, so I think that they are connected, but I don't think it needs to be this straightforward because you can harm or benefit, uh, then you're directly wronging. It seems like you, there's still space to act wrongly with regard to. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know your name. Katie. Katie. I wanted to ask you about uh, the connection between justice and rights. Yeah. So in. Um, Way back in the I don't know 80s or 90s, in the rights literature, there was this big debate about non-Western cultures and whether rights were sort of Western conception. And in that literature, which was super weird and messy, but what seemed to come out of it was that there there are conceptions of justice that aren't that don't involve rights. At least that's sort of how I read it. Um, that there are duties involved, perhaps, and there are ways we ought to treat others, but not in virtue of their entitlement to such treatment, you know, but in virtue of something else. And it seems, so I would describe that as, you know, a conception of justice that's not a rights-based one. How, would you say that that's not a conception of justice, it's one of these other things, like fairness but not justice, or? Yeah, so I guess like I'm inclined to think that it's not justice, um, but partly because I just don't, I have a difficult time getting a handle on the moral landscape if you've got this concept where what it is to act justly is to have certain duties but nobody has a claim over you to act in certain ways and then I think well that starts to look a lot like beneficence right um, and maybe that's fine right I mean maybe beneficence is really where we ought to be focusing and not so much on justice but I guess if you're interested in, in retaining the concept of justice as the concept which I've defined it here, then it seems to me that you, yeah, that you want to keep them distinct. I mean, I, do, I guess I could just don't. I I struggle to understand why it's an account of justice if the recipients don't have any claims that they're completely at the mercy of those who. Yeah, I mean, to have no claims isn't to have no complaint about being harmed by somebody violating the duty. Um, 
And so, I mean, it seems like this sort of the, the claim talk is where the rights comes from. Yeah. But you might understand what the wrongness is and what the complaint is in a way that doesn't work quite that way. Can you just, is there anything more that you can say about what the nature of the wrong is? Because um, I guess I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite familiar with like what it is that you've got in mind when it comes to these alternative conceptions of justice. So yeah, I, and part of this is sort of sketching this all yeah. out, and I'm the wrong person to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it seems that you know somebody, say somebody's supposed to, you know, treat people in my role in a certain way, and you know, they didn't treat me that way, and then I suffered. <coughs> Right? And it's not that, you know, oh, I sort of have this entitlement and virtue, be, but it's just, you know, we have a sense that there are sort of ways things are supposed to go, and then somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to, you know, in a way that's bad for me, and I'm like, that wasn't cool. So I guess that I think that if we unpack that notion of complaint, it would start to look a lot more like entitlement. And one, so one thing I'm wondering about is, it seems like there are going to be conditions under which that's legitimate to Right, um, and then I want to know more about like well, what makes certain conditions legitimate for the complaint. And then you might think that like there's going to be some story of well, in that particular situation, you're entitled to because of X. Now, whether you're entitled to because you've got a right to, that might be where we want to have the dispute. But I guess I'm wondering whether if you unpack it enough, it, you start to get the the talk of rights back in. But yeah, I take the point. <laughs> Yep, right next to Katie. So yeah. Uh, yeah, you said that uh, biocentrists would answer to uh, sentience. Uh, I don't know what you call it, like people who center on sentience, saying that like that's a uh, that's a criteria typically a uh, human. Mm -hmm. But how like how do people answer to that? Do, do you have people who like own it and say like yes, that's the only like we there is no way we cannot do something that is centered for human because that's how we judge. Or like, do you have people claiming that they can actually distance themselves from like uh, the human version vision of the world to 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 be aware from like this point of view, this bias? So I take it that the animal rights theorists who want to defend sentience as a threshold for justice think that um, that it's not anthropocentric, right? They they don't understand the accusation. They think that like what they're picking out is neutrally, morally neutrally, um, the same feature, right? The thing that's required for uh, to be a recipient of justice. But of course the objection is it's not morally neutral, it's arbitrary, you know, you just picked it out of the air and you've done it because it's like something that you share with the animals that you want to protect and not with the other entities that outside of those bounds. But. So like, no one, like, I mean, you don't have anyone like saying, okay, that's something for centric and we'll go for it. Like, people no. actually feel, if they, if they were to recognize it isn't triple centric, they would feel like they were losing the argument? I think that like, I guess, that no, there's very little discussion between um, between these people. I mean, Donaldson and Kim Luka are probably the, the only account I know where we're, actually, where we're specifically talking about justice. Um, where they want to try to respond to environmental ethicists, right? So where they directly do that. And so that's why they're invoking all of these different notions, I think, because they're trying to, trying to make the case that this appeal to sentience isn't just morally arbitrary, right? That there's something morally relevant about the capacity for sentience. And that's why it can do this, um, this work <coughs> of setting the threshold, okay? But they don't, I mean, they don't think that they're, you know, anthropocentric bias, they think that it is morally relevant, it's not morally arbitrary. And like biocentrists they claim to not be anthropocentrists, like, because if you like, if you say a plant is better this way than the other way, you still like, it's still a human saying this from your point of view. Um, yeah, but then I think we just, that depends on how you're using the term anthropocentric. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so much that the claim that the appeal to sentience is anthropocentric is just about, is really about where we're going to set the bar for justice, and the four is, I think, something along the lines of you've just picked a feature that suits you and the animals that you like. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. Greg. Sorry. Did you have your hand? No, you didn't. Oh, sorry, Duncan. <laughs> No, sorry, sorry, I thought I'd seen your hand, but I'll put you up. Sorry, Ned. 
Um, sorry. I have trouble getting this out. But so, so um, people who want to say ecosystems are non sentient creatures, they have dignity or they're vulnerable. And, and you don't, you think that's not enough to justify claim rights. I mean, they need, there needs to be a connection made there. But you also say that sentientist needs to make a connection between being sentient and having claim rights. And then you said, and you think they've done that. And I would like you to sort of say, why, what have they done that ties those more closely than the people promoting rights for trees or ecosystems based on their dignity or vulnerability? Okay, good. Um, so I think that, you know, actually there is, there are arguments to be had. Um, that the, and I actually think that in a lot of environmental ethics in the 80s, a lot of people were making these arguments about intrinsic values. So there's some more status-based arguments um, for non-sentient entities, which I think could be plugged in and would at least sort of satisfy the gap that I'm sort of gesturing at. But I don't I mean satisfy the gap of whether the argument's convincing, I think, remains to be seen. Um, and I guess that um, so, so one thing that I'm not sure about that I didn't talk about, and um, um, I think that I want to be able to say more about is this idea of um, claim that there being claim rights that are enforceable. Because I guess, like, what I'm not sure about in some of the talk of moral rights that non sentient entities have, whether they're the kinds of rights that people have got in mind. Um, and I think that that kind of comes out when people start talking about uh, cl the clashes between rights of different individuals. And quite often you find that, um, so Fulford does this, suddenly the rights of the non-sentient entities, well, they're always going to be defeated in some way, right? Or often going to be defeated. So then you start to wonder whether it's really the kind of claim right, that, you know, the, they've got the kind of right that I'm talking about here, which is necessary for entitlements of justice. In the case of um, the sentientists, so I guess like I my okay, so one thing I want to say is that I worry a bit about what I've done here that I've just pushed the problem back again, right? So it's very difficult to connect sentience. I mean, what's so special about sentience, which means that you have claim rights? My other question just emerges, I think, at this point. Um, but I guess that I do think that um, accounts, that there are going to be some status-based accounts that are, can make room for the value of non-sentient entities without holding that their um, rights holders, um, so I've got in mind Francis Camp here. Um, but I also am worried that like, she wants to draw a, a boundary around those entities which are rights holders and they're the sentient entities. And it's not altogether clear why. Right? So there's, I think there's still a gap that I can't answer right now. Um, but I do, I, I find some of the sentientist arguments about why animals have rights slightly more convincing. But um, yeah, I think I just have to hold my hand up and say I'm not so sure. <laughs> Uh, Antoine? <clears throat> yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, many of the questions you uh, dealt with in your presentation were in more classical environmental philosophy. It seems to be dealt with around the concept of moral considerability. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, very recently I've uh, come across this literature that you were talking about, and I was wondering how those two research traditions stand with respect to each other, and how uh, those two ways to approach the question stand with respect to each other. If I want to engage with that literature, can I just assume that uh, being just uh, having entitlement to justice is the same, the same thing as being morally considerable? Or yeah, so I guess like in relation to what I just said there. So I think that it's possible to be morally considerable without being um, a bearer of rights. Um, I also think it's possible for some, so, you know, to be morally considerable, to be a source of reasons for us to act in certain ways but still not be a bearer of rights. Um, so I guess what you're looking for if you want to plug the kind of gap 
that I'm gesturing at for the right is that there's, so you need to move beyond moral considerability to claims about um, uh, a particular, I think it's going to have to be a particular kind of status for non-sentient entities, um, and it's not just morally consi moral considerability, and at that point it might be, I guess, it might work for them to look at some of the status-based accounts of human rights to see whether similar arguments might be made. Um, yeah, so, so I actually find a lot of that original literature much more useful for thinking about justice and rights and the dispute between the various positions now because I think a lot of that stuff has got lost. Um, people now just invoke flourishing, <laughs> well-being, dignity um, and then say, of course, it connects to justice, and it's not altogether clear why. <laughs> um, but yeah. Duncan. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I guess you actually just you kind of just addressed this. Uh, okay. when you were addressing, I think, Ned's question, but I wanted to <clears throat> emphasize it. Um, I really enjoyed the talk, um, but I kind of I worry that we're going to run into the same. As you mentioned, the same yeah. dialectical sort of impasse. I think it's, yeah. But we're just going to talk about it in terms of rights instead of <laughs> instead of directly in terms of justice, um, because the sentientist is going to say, right, to have rights, you've got to have interests, which requires sentience, and then the biocentrist will say, well, that's arbitrary. That's morally that's a mar morally arbitrary um, criterion, and then the sentientist will say. Well, I wonder though whether there might not be a useful discussion to be had about which are the appropriate theories of rights or how we ought to be theorising about rights, both in the case of animals and non-sentient entities. Because I, so I have grave misgivings about the recent turn in animal rights towards assuming interest-based theories of rights. Um, it's not obvious to me that that's the right way that we should be going, and yet continually you get this talk about interest and well-being and rights to protect those things and there's and that's those things seem to ground rights as well um, so I, I guess like maybe it's just a, a call to be slightly more open and transparent about the kinds of theories of rights um, that we've got analyses of rights that we've got operating in the background um, which so I agree that maybe that philosophical discussion at some point just bombs out in like brute intuitions competing, but I still feel like there's room for some more argumentation about the kind of theory of rights that you want to adopt, and whether that's whether you're just cherry picking for your own purposes, right? So yeah, and I don't know enough about the status the status yeah. theory, um, but the other ones, if you take that off the table, it looks like you would run into the same. Yeah. Dialectical impasse because the sentientists will say, well, it's not, it can't be the desire. The desire view is not going to ground the rights of non sentient bio. Yeah. Things. The, the will view, the will based view is not going to do it. Um, but the animal, I mean, so the will based view isn't going to work for animals, right? So, <laughs> well, I don't know. No, I don't no, know. no, I guess like, so I this, but I think this is the issue. Like, I, I guess, like, I've, I think that's an open question. About yeah, so I think it might be depending on the view how you want to, well, um, but yeah, it's just, I guess, like I feel that like there's still some more argumentation to be had about which theory of rights we ought to be adopting um, across the board, right? So not just for particular entities, which we cherry pick a theory for that. Yeah. Uh, Mark? So um, I don't myself disagree with anything you said, but I wanted to sort of put on like a biocentrist hat and uh, give an argument that if you think that it, that view of how to value individuals is right, then it should make sense to think those non-sentient things can have claims of justice too. So like, uh, so here's sort of a story that I came up with that maybe land, but um, so suppose I'm like a rich person and I have a nice house, but I think it'd be better to have a cat here because I'll get some benefit from having a cat around. And so I get a cat, and um, we will benefit. I feed the cat and give it a nice life, and it makes my life better. And then I'm like, I'm going to go on a vacation, so I think, okay, so I'll just leave that cat, it will starve to death, and then I'll get a new one when I come back. That's wrong. And 
someone could say, in addition to it being wrong because I neglect the well-being of the cat, it's also wrong because, like, because of this reciprocity and stuff, the story about me and the cat, it, like, has a claim of justice against me. It's a further stringent reason why I can't neglect the work that in addition to its well-being interest. So then if I also have installed in my house some sort of, like, um, plant thing that cleans the air and gives me other benefits like that, insofar as I have this sort of view about the value of that thing that says I have to care about the well-being of that stuff, like in the way that a biocentrist does, why couldn't they say the same thing? Like, what's really the non-question begging argument against them saying the same thing about the case where I think, I'm going to go out of town for a month, I'll just let the plants die, and then I'll buy new ones when I come back. Like, there's this reciprocity relationship there, so isn't that the right sort of thing that would ground, assuming that those well-being, so to speak, interests are there, there's also this reciprocity thing going on that if you think the well-being story makes sense, it would then make sense that the, that in, those individual individuals have a claim of justice against me in addition to the general reasons I have to care about their well-being. Okay, so I think there were like two, two things bound up together in that. So the notion of reciprocity Right. Um, so Fulfer takes a similar kind of line. So she wants to say that like we can, the dignity in non-sentient entities is kind of connected to our relationship with them, right, and the ways in which we we value them. Um, and the idea of reciprocity is pretty common in like theories of justice, right, um, for humans. Um, but I guess that I want to deny. Um, that relations of reciprocity are necessary uh, to count as a candidate for justice. Um, I would want to just pin it all on, like, uh, well, what do I want to put it on this question? But let's just, for now, assume it's something to do with, like, well-being or something like that. Let's go with the well-being that you already mentioned. Um, so I don't think that the reciprocity is necessary. Um, and, and I think that you... Plausibly, if you think that you've got a reason to like, the reason that you um, feel like you have a duty to the plant presumably isn't just like rela relational in that way, right? So you think that there's something good for the plant if you like do some, you know, if you water it and if you don't go away on holiday uh, and leave it. And I guess like, so what I'm not sure, so what I don't understand is why it's not enough to say, yeah, like the plant is gonna die if you don't water it, right? And that's gonna be like bad for the plant. Um, I don't owe it to the plant to water it, but like it at least gives me a reason to think about whether I ask my neighbor to pop in like every few days, right? So that's, the, I guess like I don't, why is that story not sufficient? And why do we have to rely on this idea that Somehow, like, I have a directed duty to the plant. If I don't water it, I do an injustice, right? I, like, buy the, the, the strongest story seems so, somewhat implausible to me. Um, and I don't know why the weaker story is not sufficient. So that, I know that I was speaking, yeah. I didn't answer your question directly, but. <laughs> uh, there was a question over there, yeah? I'm sorry, I know you know. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you really enjoyed it. Uh, the first is a request for clarification, mm -hmm. something about you just mentioned. Uh, um, could you elaborate a bit more uh, about this idea that injustice is a wrong done directly to the in question and how that is a particular wrong that is different from other kinds of wrongs? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a clarification request. And the other is that uh, I'm not convinced about um, this very strong connection you're making between justice and rights. I understand that. Uh, that's the standard talk, but mm -hmm. I think there are other ways. I was thinking even Rawls, John Rawls, uh, understands justice as a beauty. Uh, Plato, there's a long tradition to <coughs> justice is understood as a virtue. And when you think uh, about justice in terms of virtue, you are saying something, you're, you're saying more about the duty bearer than about the recipient of justice. So when you do that, maybe rights. Uh, are not the central concept that you need to work on in order to uh, ascribe uh, obligation or duties of justice. 
Uh, can you just say that last bit again? Sorry, yeah. I was thinking about the first bit. And then I got distracted. <laughs> no, when you think, uh, when you conceptualize justice in terms yeah. of uh, virtue, so yeah. justice is a virtue of institutions or of individuals and so on, then uh, the concept of right um, is not that central to uh, understanding justice and how you uh, establish the relationship of justice between again, uh, collectives or individuals or institutions and other entities. So then you can think of justice in terms of a virtue, in terms of virtues, and then the concept of rights is secondary to understand what are the obligations of justice. Okay. Um, good. Uh, so in response to the first question, so I take it that um, I can wrong you without, so was the, so, okay, so was the question, um, are there any wrongs which are not directed in I, the, the central point is that I think you can commit an injustice without affecting directly an Okay. So I don't think that's an essential character. Can you give me an example? I don't know if I don't pay my taxes. Yeah, but you are affecting, I guess like, so you are affecting someone in that case, right? So you're... Yeah, but in, in most wrongs, I mean, that's not something specific of justice, of, of injustice. Right? Um, but I guess like, so in those cases, um, everybody who puts into the taxation system has a claim over everybody else that they put into the taxation system. So everybody has a correlative, like direct duty to, to put into the taxation system. Yeah. So that's, I guess, the, the what I would think about that okay. case. I think that we can obviously do wrongs to one another and other things. Uh, well, not to well, one another. <laughs> uh, that we can do. Um, direct wrongs to one another that, might, uh, that are not injustices. Um, so I can wrong you by not turning up to your birthday party, but I promise you that I would do, but we wouldn't count that as an injustice. Um, uh, on the value virtue, uh, well, yeah, virtue um, claims that justice is about the virtue of social institutions. Um, it partly is, right? I agree with rules a bit about that. I don't think it's a virtue only of social institutions. Um, I think that justice is something that can track all kinds of states of affairs and interpersonal relationships as well. Um, and I think that, I guess, I'm not entirely sure what the virtue of describing things as just or unjust would be if there wasn't some story about duty bearers and entitlement bearers within a particular system, right? So I guess like, I find it quite hard to, so um, let's say that a particular, so we want to describe a particular system as having the virtue um, of justice, for example. Um, part and parcel of that story is going to be that entitlement bearers and duty bearers are receiving what they're due and fulfilling their duties, right? It kind of has to be it's all part of the same story. So I guess like, I don't see why I talk about justice as the first virtue of social institutions it means that we don't talk about rights, because it does, right? Rules is first principle, basic, equal basic liberties, right? That's what makes the society or the institutions just, is that they secure for people their rights. Yeah, I just think that that's a particular use of uh, justice as beauty. I mean, there are many others that wouldn't require talking about rights, but just respecting again, status or other kind of things that do not require thinking. And I think I want to contest that. I yeah. think I just don't see what the what it would mean to to res to yeah to show respect to entities in a way that justice requires, yeah. where they're not entitled to it as a matter of justice. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to ask the question again. <laughs> um, so, so there's two separate claims, I think, in what you're saying. So one claim is the claim that's up there right now, that in order to be a recipient of justice, I also need to be uh, eligible for yeah. claim rights. But then there's a separate claim, which I think you also are committed to, which is that injustice needs to be about rights violation and yeah. wronging. And you refer to Pogger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one concern that I have about this kind of approach, both in relation to global justice and also in relation to non-human animals is that it means that we, re we need to respond differently to equal amounts of suffering. So if you're suffering 
because of the rights violation to someone who's talking to you, mm -hmm. and I'm suffering because it's a natural disaster, for example, then your rights were violated, and mine were. <coughs> so, you know, combined with the priority of claims, mm -hmm. you have a much stronger claim. Actually, I might not have any. I, I don't have a claim of justice, but you do, but we're suffering. Yeah equal amounts. And I think I mean, in the global justice context, I think it's problematic because yeah, yeah. always needs to make these arguments about how the global poor are actually wronged by things that people do you know, in, in industrialized countries. It's not enough that they're suffering, uh, and some of the suffering might have natural causes. Yeah. Um, so that's always a problem, I think, for those kinds of uh, accounts. And equally, a lot of, harm, a lot of harms that animals experience are not due to rights violations. So um, animals being harmed by other animals, because I mean, to the extent that they're not agents, they're not violating rights. They're just harming without wronging. Yeah. So we would have to treat the suffering of wild animals very different from uh, very differently from the suffering of domesticated animals, for example. <coughs> you know, where we're involved and we're wronging, but so that's clearly different. So on your account, the domesticated animals would have claims of justice. And so I think that's a bit of a, yeah, so that's a worry that. So I guess like, I don't think I'm committed to that. Um, because I think that I haven't said anything about the content of the rights, right? So all I've said right. is that, so I, I think that even in the global justice case, there are rights violations when we fail to assist, right? right. So that we have positive um, mm -hmm. rights towards others in natural disaster situations. And the same might be true of animals with whom we don't have close relationships with. So I don't think that a rights violation need occur only when we interfere with negative rights. It might also occur when we fail to step mm -hmm. in and assist. So does that kind of answer or do but you think that's still too slippery? So, um, so it doesn't, so it means that I can now describe you know, my suffering that's the cause of a natural disaster yeah. as a claim of justice. Yeah. But it would seem that your suffering, which is the result of some sort of you, is kind of still more weighty because you're suffering equal amount and also you're suffering as a result of you being wrong. So I think that like there are differences in what there are differences in the kinds of wrongs that are involved, right? So that that might mean that there are different stories we want to tell about um, who's responsible, who Cold war, blah, 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 like who bears responsibility for like rectifying um, the injustice. But I don't find it that convincing that there's much of a kind of difference there in. Um, yeah, I just think that, you know, if you are the victim of a natural, uh, natural disaster and I'm in a position to help you and you have like these rights, right? And I've got a duty to help you, and that's like. No, no, the question is if you have a choice, if you, have, if you can either help the person who is assaulted or the person who's the. Well, if it's a choice where, like, the choice is mutually exclusive, you can only do one thing or the other, then you might have a greater responsibility to rectify the injustice that you perpetrated. But I think that's an additional consideration. I don't take it to be foundational to the. The content of well, to the to the concept of justice, right? I think that's just something that we fill in later when we decide like what the content of rights is. Okay. Any other questions? Are people ready for coffee? Coffee break. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks, Andy. Okay.